Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Episode 5 Pip's life has been wrecked by the return of the convict from his childhood, who has revealed himself as Pip's mysterious benefactor. It was obvious that keeping my dreaded visitor hidden in the chambers was impossible. Not to get up a mystery with people, I resolved to announce that my uncle had unexpectedly come from the country. Soon after early dawn, I notified the lodgekeeper. A stranger asked for you, sir, just before 11. I've said, uh, my uncle. He'll be staying a short while. Likewise the person with him? A person was with him? Well, I judged him to be, sir. The person stopped when your uncle stopped to make inquiry of me. And the person took the way when your uncle did. What sort of person? Uh, well, a working man, sort of dust-coloured clothes and a dark coat. Anything else? Oh, well, I didn't rightly look hard. My mind was much troubled by these two circumstances taken together. The arrival of my convict and a stranger lurking. I lit the fire, prepared breakfast, and waited. My dear, dear boy! I don't even know what name to call you. I've given out that you are my uncle. That's it, dear boy. Call me uncle. You assume some name, I suppose, on board ship. Promise. What's your real name? Magwitch. Christian. Abel. Promise you, huh? When you called in at the gate and asked the watchman the way here last night, had you anyone with you? No, dear boy. Are you known in London? Not over and above, dear boy. I was in the provinces, mostly. Were you tried in London? Which time? The last. First known Mr. Jaggers that way. Jaggers was for me. And what I'd done is worked out and paid for. This is good. I'm a heavy grubber, dear boy, but I always was. If it had been in my constitution to be a lighter grubber, I might have got into lighter trouble. Likewise, I must have my smoke. And this is the gentleman what I made. A real, genuine one. It does be good for to look at your pip. All I stipulate is to stand by and look at you, dear boy. There's something worth spending in that there book. It's yours. All I've got ain't mine. It's yours. I've come to the old country for to see my gentleman spend his money like a gentleman. And blast the old blast you, everyone, from the judge in his wig to the colonists to stirring up the dust on me. I'll show you a better gentleman than a whole kit on your butt together. Stop! I want to speak to you. I want to know what is to be done. I want to know how you are to be kept out of danger. How long you are going to stay. What projects you have. Look here, Pip. I've forgotten myself. What I said was low. That's what it was. Low, Pip. Look over it. Why ain't it going to be low? No. Go on, dear boy. You was a saying? First... How are you to be guarded from the danger you have incurred? Like so great. Who knows? There's Jaggers and there's Wemmick and there's you. Who else is there to inform? Second, is there any chance person who might identify you in the street? I don't intend to advertise myself in the papers by the name of Abel Magwitz, come back from Botany Bay. Pip, if the danger had been fifty times as great... I should have come to see you, just to say. Third, how long do you remain? I'm not going back. I've come for good. Fourth, where are you to live? 
Where will you be safe? The boy. There's disguising wigs and spectacles and black clothes can be bought for money. As to the how and where of living, dear boy, give me your own opinions on it. You take it smoothly now, but you were very serious last night when you swore it was death. And death by the rope in the open street, not far from this. But to go back now would be as bad as to stand ground. Worse. I'm here, Pip, because I've meant it by you. Years and years. So, let me have a look at my gentleman again. I'll find somewhere nearby when Herbert comes back in two or three days. Who? My friend. You're using his room. If he's to know. Even then, dear boy, we'll have him on his oath. On this. And he pulled out a greasy little black testament I'd last seen when he'd made me swear on it in the churchyard oh so long ago. Finally, he agreed to remain shut up in the chambers until I had been to Little Britain. I merely want, Mr Jaggers, to assure myself that what I have been told is true. Told or informed? Told would seem to imply verbal communication, and that's impossible with a man in New South Wales. I will say informed. Good. I have been informed by a person named Abel Magwitch that he is the benefactor so long unknown to me. This is the man in New South Wales. And only he? He alone. I am not so unreasonable, sir, as to think you at all responsible for my mistakes and wrong conclusions, but I always supposed it was Miss Havisham. As you say, Pip, I am not at all responsible for that. In communication, Magwitch appeared to me to have obscurely hinted at some distant idea he had of seeing you here in England. I cautioned him that I must hear no more of that that he was expatriated for the term of his natural life, and that his presenting himself in this country would be an act of felony, rendering him liable to the extreme penalty of the law. He guided himself by it, no doubt. No doubt. I have been informed by Wemmick that he has received a letter under date Portsmouth from a colonist named Purvis. Or Provis. Thank you, Pip. Perhaps you know it is Purvis. Yes. Hmm. The letter asked for the particulars of your address on behalf of Magwitch. Wemmick sent them, I understand, by return of post. Uh, probably it is through Provis that you've received the explanation of Magwitch in New South Wales. It came through Provis. In writing to Magwitch, or in communicating with him through Provis, have the goodness to mention that the particulars and vouchers of our long account shall be sent to you, together with the balance... For there is still a balance remaining. Good day, Pip. I went straight back to the temple, where I found the terrible Provis drinking rum and water and smoking Negro head in safety. The influences of his solitary hut life were upon him always and gave him a savage air no dress could tame. In a thousand small, nameless instances, arising every minute in the day, there he was, prisoner, felon, bondsman, plain as plain could be. Every hour increased my disgust and hatred. Then, thankfully, after five days, Herbert's footstep on the staircase. Provis, who had been asleep, staggered to his feet, his jackknife shining in his hand. Quiet, it's Herbert. Handel, my dear fellow, how are you? How are you? How are you? You're thin and pale. Oh, I beg your pardon. Herbert, this... 
This is a visitor of mine. It's all right. Now, boy, take this book in your right hand, Pip's comrade. Lord, strike you dead on the spot. If ever you split in any way, some ever. Kiss it. Do as he wishes. Shake. Now you're on your oath, you know. And never believe me on mine. If Pip shan't make a gentleman on you. In vain should I attempt to describe the astonishment and disquiet of Herbert when he and I and Provis sat down before the fire and I recounted the whole of the secret. Enough that I saw my own feelings reflected in Herbert's face and not least among them, my repugnance towards the man who had done so much for me. It was midnight before I could leave him in the room we had found for him in Essex Street and return with relief to my own. What is to be done? My poor dear Handel, I'm too stunned to think. The dreadful truth is, Herbert, he's attached. Strongly attached to me. Was there ever such a fate? What can I do? Cut him off? Never take another penny off him? I'm heavily in debt, bred for no calling and fit only to go for a soldier. How can I repay him? You can't repay him by soldiering. You'd be infinitely better in Carricker's house, small as it is. But there's another question. This is an ignorant, determined man who has long had one fixed idea. More than that, I may misjudge him. He seems to me to be a man of desperate and fierce character. I know he is. I've seen him almost murder a man. See, then, think of this. He comes here at the peril of his life for the realisation of his fixed idea. In the moment of realisation, after all his toil and waiting, you cut the ground from under his feet, destroy his idea, and make his gains worthless. It is unimaginable what he might do under the disappointment. That is his real power over you as long as he remains in England. And that would be his reckless course if you forsook him. Then what is to be done? The first and main thing is to get him out of England. You will have to go with him. And then he may be induced to go. But wherever I get him, how can I prevent him coming back? Newgate. And if a pretext could be made out of that other convict, or out of anything else in his life... I know that... nothing of him, except as the miserable wretch who terrified me for two days in my childhood. Handel, you feel convinced you can take no further benefits from him? Fully. And you feel convinced you must break with him? Yes. And you have... And are bound to have that tenderness for the life he has risked on your account. That you must save him, if possible, from throwing it away. Yes. Then you must get him out of England before you stir a finger to extricate yourself. In heaven's name. And we'll see it out together, dear old boy. <sighs> Herbert, of his life, I must ask him point blank. When we sit at breakfast in the morning. I'd like to know more about that man and you. It's strange not to know about you. Will, you're on oath. Both on you. Assuredly. Yes. My life, short and handy. In jail, out of jail. In, out. That's it, pretty much. Down to such times as I got shipped. After a pip here stood my friend. I've been locked up more than a silver tea kettle. I've been done everything to pretty well, except get hanged. Started off thieving turnips. Then I was left to myself. I got the name of being hardened. Ask yourselves whether you would have been over ready to give me work. Being a bit of a poacher, a bit of a labourer, a bit of a wagoner, haymaker, hawker, a bit of most things that don't pay and lead to trouble. That's how I got to be a man. And then, 20 years ago, at Epsom Races, I got in with a man whose skull I'd crack with a poker. 
His right name was Compasson. That's the man you see me pounding in that deep pit, my dear boy. He set up for a gentleman. He'd been to a public boarding school and had learning. For a smooth talking and a dab at the ways of gentlefolk. Good looking, too. Very noticing look. I think this is a man might suit. To judge from appearances, you're out of luck. Yes, master. And I've never been in it much. Luck changes. There's room. <laughs> what can you do? Eat and drink, if you'll find the materials. He laughed at me and gave me five shillings. His business was the swindling, handwriting, forging, stolen banknote passing and such like. He'd no more heart than an iron file. He was as cold as death. There was another in with him, by surname Arthur. He was in a decline, and with a shadow to look at. Him and Compasson had been in a bad thing with a rich lady some years afore, and had made a pot of money by it. But Compass and Betty and gamed, he'd have run through the king's taxes. Arthur was dying, and had the horrors. Well, the second or third time I ever seen him, he comes tearing downstairs for Compass and his wife, in only a flannel gown, and his hair all in a sweat. No, she really is upstairs along of me now. And I can't get rid of her. She's all in white, with white flowers. She's awful mad. She's got a shroud hanging over her arm. And she, she says she'll put, put it on me at five in the morning. Fool. You know she's got a living body. How could she be up there without coming through the door here? She's standing at the foot of the bed. Awful mad. And over where her heart's broke. You broke it. It's blood. Get this dribbling, sick, mad man back up. And my witch, yeah. give her a hand, will you? And give him his liquor. Oh, He'll quieten. There she is again. She's lifting me up. Keep me down. Keep me. Keep me down. And he lifted himself up hard and was dead. Pip's comrade. Yes. To compass and it was good riddance. He made me swear on this book like you have. And he got me into such nets as made me his black slave for four or five years. And no mercy. My missus. There ain't no need to go into her. And last, the Compasson was committed on a charge of putting stolen notes in circulation. He's his. Separate defences. No communication. I sold all the clothes I had except what hung on my back. Afore I could get jaggers. In a box, despite his eyes ever moving, he looked young, innocent. Me. Why me has he been tried afore? I've been known uphill and down dale in bridal wells and lock-ups. And when the verdict came, why did Compasson, as was recommended to mercy on account of good character and bad company, he gets seven, me, fourteen. I told him, out of his court, I'll smash that face of yours. And he was protected. I had a ground to be low. Yeah, boy. When I got out of that prison ship on them marshes, I was given to understand by my boy here, Compasson was escaped as well as me. I hunted him down. I smashed his face. And then the soldiers come. Of course, 
He gets the best of it. His character was so good. I was put back in irons, brought to trial again, and sent for life. But I didn't stop for life, dear boy. And Pip's comrade, being here. Is he dead, Compasson? He hopes I am. If he's alive, that's sure. I'll never learn no more of him. Pip. Miss Havisham's half-brother was called Arthur. Compasson is the man who professed to be Miss Havisham's lover. If Compasson was still alive and discovered Provis, he would inform on him to rid himself of the threat. But before I could consider leaving the country with my patron, I had to see Estella. I discovered that she was at Satis house. The next day, I had the meanness to feign that I was under a binding promise to go down to Joe. Herbert would take care of Provis. After a drizzly ride, the early day came up halting, whimpering and shivering like a beggar. I breakfasted at the Blue Boar when in slouched Bentley Drummle. Have you just come down? Yes. Beastly place. Your part of the country, I think. Very like your Shropshire, I'm told. Not a bit. You stay long? Can't say, do you? Can't say. Large tract of marshes about here, I believe. What of that? <laughs> Are you amused, Mr. Drummle? Not particularly. Waiter. Yes, sir. That horse of mine ready? Brought round to the door, sir. Look here, you. The lady won't ride today. Weather won't do. Very good, sir. And I'm dining at the ladies. Very good, sir. You still lose your temper? Mr. Drummle, you are not competent to talk on that subject. I did not seek this conversation, and I don't think it an agreeable one. I'm sure it's not. I don't think anything about it. With your leave, therefore, I suggest we hold no communication in future. Don't lose your temper. Haven't you lost enough? without that. What do you mean, sir? Waiter, you quite understand I dine at the young ladies. Quite so, sir. Choking and boiling, I watched him through the window, seize the horse's mane, mount in his blundering, brutal manner, then sidle and back away into the rain. A man in dust-coloured dress had held the horse, and from his slouching shoulders and ragged hair, he reminded me of Orlick. And what wind blows you here, Pip? She was seated on a settee near the fire, Estella on a cushion at her feet, knitted. What I have to say to Estella, Miss Havisham, I will say before you in a few moments. It will not surprise you. It will not displease you. I am as unhappy as you can ever have meant me to be. I have found out who my patron is. It is a discovery unlikely ever to enrich me in reputation, station, fortune, anything. There are reasons why I must say no more of that. It is not my secret, but another's. But when I fell into the mistake I have so long remained in, namely that you were my patron, you led me on. Yes. Was that kind? Who am I, for God's sake, that I should be kind? You made your own snares. I never made them. What else? I should be false and base if I did not tell you that you deeply wrong both Mr. Matthew Pocket and his son Herbert if you suppose them, unlike the rest of your relations, to be other than generous, upright, open and incapable of anything designing or mean. Miss Havisham, if you would spare the money to do my friend Herbert a lasting service in life, but which, from the nature of the case, must be done without his knowledge... I could show you how. Why without his knowledge? Because I began the service myself more than two years ago without his knowledge, and I don't want to be betrayed. Why I fail in my ability to finish it, I cannot explain. 
It is part of that secret which is another's, not mine. What else? Estella, you know I love you. You know that I have loved you long and dearly. I should have said this sooner, but for my long mistake, it induced me to hope Miss Havisham meant us for one another. While I thought you could not help yourself, as it were, I refrained from saying it, but I must say it now. I... I know... I have no hope that I shall ever call you mine, Estella. I am ignorant what may become of me very soon, how poor I may be, or where I may go. Still, I love you. I have loved you ever since I first saw you in this house. It would have been horribly cruel in Miss Havisham to practice on the susceptibility of a poor boy through all those years as an idle pursuit, but I think she did not. I do think that in the endurance of her own trial, she forgot mine, Estella. When you say you love me, I know what you mean as a form of words, but nothing more. You address nothing in my breast, you touch nothing there. I don't care for what you say at all. I have tried to warn you of this, now have I not? Yes. I thought and hoped you could not mean it. You, so young, untried and beautiful, Estella. Surely it is not in nature. It is in my nature. It is in the nature formed within me. I make a great difference between you and all other people when I say so much. I can do no more. Is it not true that Bentley Drummle is in town here and pursuing you? Quite true. That, that, that you encourage him and ride out with him? And that he dines with you this very day? True. You cannot love him, Estella. What have I told you? Do you still think, in spite of it, that I do not mean what I say? You would never marry him, Estella. Why not tell you the truth? I am going to be married to him. Estella, dearest, dearest Estella, do not let Miss Havisham lead you into this fatal step. I am going to be married to him. The preparations for my marriage are making, and I shall be married soon. Why do you introduce the name of my mother by adoption? It is my own act. To fling yourself away on such a, a brute... Should I fling myself away upon the man who would soonest feel, if people do feel such things, that I took nothing to him? It is done. I shall do well enough, and so will my husband. But... Say no uh, more. We shall never understand each other. He's such a mean, stupid brute! Don't be afraid of my being a blessing to him. I shall not be that. Come. Here is my hand. Do we part on this? You will get me out of your thoughts in a week. Never. You are part of my existence. Part of myself. You have been in every line I have ever read. Since I first came here, the rough, common boy whose poor heart you wounded even then. You have been in every prospect I have ever seen since. On the river, on the sails of ships, on the marshes, in the clouds, in the sea, in the streets. Estella, to the last hour of my life, you cannot choose but remain part of my character, part of the little good in me, part of the evil. But in this separation, I associate you only with the good, and I will faithfully hold you to that always, for you must have done me far more good than harm. Let me now feel what sharp distress I may. Oh, God bless you. 
God forgive you. Afterwards, I remembered that while Estella looked at me merely with incredulous wonder, the spectral figure of Miss Havisham, her hand still covering her heart, seemed all resolved into a ghastly stare of pity and remorse. All done. All gone. To avoid drummle, everything, I struck off immediately to walk all the way to London. It was past midnight when I crossed London Bridge. My readiest access to the temple was close by the riverside through Whitefriars, as it seldom happened that I came in at that gate, and as I was muddy and weary, I did not take it ill that the porter should ask my name. Ah, uh, I was not quite sure, but I thought so. There's a note here, sir. The messenger what brought it said, would you be so good as to read it by my lantern? There. Thank you. It was in Wemmick's handwriting, and it said simply, Don't go home. Turning immediately from the temple gate, I took a late coach to Covent Garden and there found a hotel for the night. I could not sleep. Whatever night fancies and noises crowded in on me, they never warded off the don't-go-home of the note. At seven the next morning, I was on my way to Wemmick at Woolworth. Hello, Mr Pip. You did come home, then. I left a note for you at each of the gates on the chance. I came in at the Whitechapel. I'll go round the others and destroy the notes tomorrow. Never leave documentary evidence. I'm going to take a liberty with you. Would you mind toasting this sausage for the aged P? Delighted. Uh, then you can go about your work, Mary Ann. Which leaves us to ourselves, don't you see, Mr Pip? I much appreciate your friendship and caution. Now we are in our private and personal capacities. I accidentally heard yesterday morning, being in a certain place where I once took you, that a certain person, not altogether of uncolonial pursuits and not unpossessed of portable property... I don't know who it may really be. We won't name this person. Not necessary. Had made some little stir in a certain part of the world where a good many people go, not always in gratification of their own inclinations and not quite irrespective of government expense, by disappearing from such place and being no more heard of thereabouts. I also heard that you at your chambers in Garden Court Temple had been watched and might be watched again. By whom? I wouldn't go into that. It might clash with official responsibilities. I heard other curious things in the same place. I don't tell it you on information received. I heard it. This watching of me at my chambers is inseparable from the person you have just been... Either it is, or it will be. I can't say more. I would like to ask you a question, if you feel it would be right. Mm -hmm. You have heard of a man of bad character whose true name is Compasson. Mm -hmm. Is he living? Mm -hmm. Is he in London? Mm -hmm. Now, questions being over, I come to what I did on hearing the aforesaid. I went to Garden Court and, finding you out, went to Clanicker's to find Mr Herbert and gave him to understand that, if he was aware of anybody, Tom, Jack or Richard, being about the chambers, he'd better get said Tom, Jack or Richard out of the way while you were out of the way. Where would be safe? Mr Pip, I'll tell you something. Under existing circumstances, there is no place like a great city when you're once in it. Don't break cover too soon. Lie close. Wait till things slacken before you try the open. 
even for foreign air. Thank you. What has Herbert done? He mentioned to me, as a secret, he was courting a young lady who has a pa. Which pa lies abed in a bow window where he can see the ships sail up and down the river. You're acquainted with the young lady, most probably? No. She sees me as an expensive companion who does Herbert no good. The house with the bow window, and being kept by a very respectable widow, a Mrs Wimple, has a furnished upper room to let. Mr Herbert put it to me, what did I think of that as a temporary tenement for Tom, Jack or Richard? Wonderful. For three reasons. It's altogether out of your beats... Without going near it yourself, you could always hear of the safety of Tom, Jack or Richard through Mr Herbert, and three, after a while, and when it might be prudent, if you should want to slip Tom, Jack or Richard on board a foreign packet boat, there he is, ready. Oh, thank you, thank you. By nine o'clock last night, Mr Herbert had housed the said Tom, Jack or Richard quite successfully, giving out at the old lodgings he was summoned to Dover. What's best is, it was done. Without you. Now, here's the address. There can be no harm in you going there tonight and seeing for yourself. But after you've gone home, don't go back there. Oh, Mr Wemmick, thank you again. Avail yourself of this evening to lay hold of his portable property. You don't know what may happen to him. Don't let anything happen to the portable property. I must be off. You look very much worried. Have a perfectly quiet day with the aged. You'll be up presently and have a little bit of... Uh, you remember the pig? Of course. Have a little bit of him. That sausage you roasted was his, and he was in all respects a first-rater. Do try him, if only for old acquaintance' sake. The aged and I enjoyed one another's company by falling asleep before Wemmick's fire more or less the whole day. Then, when it was quite dark... I left the aged preparing the fire for toast, and I inferred from the number of teacups, as well as from his glances at the two little doors in the wall, that Miss Skiffins was expected. All the waterside region of the upper and lower pool before the bridge was unknown ground to me. I was looking for Chink's Basin on Mill Pond Bank. Surprisingly, it was a fresh kind of place where the wind from the river had room to turn itself round, and there were two or three trees in it. And then, at last, a house with a wooden front and three storeys of bow windows, Mrs Wimples. It was an odd sensation to see Herbert's familiar face quite at home in that very unfamiliar place. All is well, Handel, and he is quite satisfied, though eager to see you. My dear girl is with her father. That's him. All the provisions he keeps in his room. A man with gout in his right hand through rum, trying to cut a double Gloucester. Clara has no relation in the world but old Gruff and Grim. That's his name? No, Barley. Handel? Clara? Mr Pitt? A very pretty, slight, dark-eyed girl of twenty or so had entered, whom Herbert tenderly relieved of a basket. Look here. Here's poor Clara's supper served out every night. Bread, her slice of cheese, her rum, which I drink. Hey! Papa wants me, darling. There was something so natural and winning in Clara that I would not have undone the engagement between her and Herbert for all the money in the pocketbook I had never opened. As Clara ran off to no doubt pour rum into her father, Herbert took me to see our charge, to whom I resolved not to mention the name Compeson. Do you trust Wemmick's judgment and sources of information? Aye. Aye, dear boy. Jack is no. Then, I have talked with Wemmick and have come to tell you what cautions he gave me and what advice. I. He's heard in Newgate. My chambers have been watched. Wemmick recommends keeping close for a time and I'm to stay away from you. When the best time comes, you should go abroad. I will come with you. 
Or coming back with a venture. I'll do nothing, dear boy, and Pip's comrade, to make it a desperate venture. Handel, I've been considering. We are both good watermen. We could take Mr. Campbell... <laughs> That's me. <laughs> ...down the river ourselves when the right time comes. That way no boat would be hired. No boatman. So it would save at least one chance of suspicion. Don't you think it might be a good thing if you began now to keep a boat at the temple stairs and be in the habit of rowing up and down the river? Then who notices or minds? Do it 20 or 50 times and there is nothing special in your doing at the 20 or 51st. Aye, oh, it's good, Pip's comrade. You must never recognise us if we come below bridge. But pull down the blind on the east window when you see us and all is right. Aye. Oh. We better not go home together. I'll give you a half hour's start. I don't like to leave you here, though I cannot doubt you're being safer than near me. Goodbye. Dear boy, I don't like goodbyes. Say good night. When I had taken leave of the pretty, gentle, dark eyed girl, I thought of Estella and of our parting and went home very sadly. The next day, I set myself to get the boat round to the temple stairs. Sometimes with Herbert, often alone, I trained and practised. At first, I kept above Blackfriars Bridge, but I soon learned to shoot the race and fall of water at Old London Bridge, and so began to row as far as Erith. Although Herbert was at Mill Pond Bank rarely less than three times a week, and never brought me a single word of intelligence that was at all alarming, still I knew there was cause for alarm, and I could not get rid of the notion of being watched. It was an unhappy life I lived. Convinced Estella was married, I begged Herbert never to speak of her to me. Condemned to inaction and a state of constant restlessness and suspense, I rowed about in my boat and waited, waited, and waited as best I could. There were states of the tide when, having been down river, I was forced to leave my boat at a wharf near the custom house, again serving to make me and my boat a common incident among the waterside people there. This I did one afternoon late in February, and from this slight occasion sprang two meetings. As it was a raw evening, I thought I would comfort myself with a meal in a chop house, and thence to a play at the theatre where Mr Wopsle had achieved his questionable triumph. Herbert! Herbert, listen, listen, listen to me. My dear Handel, descend. I've been to Wopsle's theatre. Oh, you? Some nautical play of mind-numbing unimportance. Wopsle came on with a star and garter on us, some plenipotentiary from the Admiralty or some such, only to be immediately shoved into a corner while everybody danced the hornpipe. Handel? From which corner? I observed he devoted the spare time he had on his hands to staring in my direction as if he were lost in amazement. So he would at you returning to the place? He was waiting for me in the street outside afterwards. I saw that you saw me. I saw you, Mr. Pip. Yeah, yes, of course, I saw you. But who else was there? No one. It is the strangest thing, and yet I could swear to him. Whether I should have noticed him at first, but for your being there, I can't be positive. And yet I think I should. I had a ridiculous fancy that he must be with you, Mr. Pip, till I saw that you were quite unconscious of him sitting behind you there like a ghost. Oh, I dare say you wonder at me, Mr. Pip. Indeed, I see you do. But it is so very strange, you'll hardly believe what I'm going to tell you. I could hardly believe it myself if you told me. Indeed? Oh, no, indeed, Mr. Pip. <laughs> You remember in old times a certain Christmas day when you were quite a child and I dined at Gargery's and some soldiers came to the door to get a pair of handcuffs mended? Very well. And you remember that there was a chase after two convicts and that we joined in it? Yes. And that we came up with the two in a ditch and that there was a scuffle between them and that one of them had been severely handled and much mauled about the face by the other? Yes. Then, Mr. Pip, one of those two prisoners sat behind you tonight. I saw him over your shoulder. Which of the two? The one who had been mauled. And I'll swear I saw him. The more I think of him, the more certain I am of him.
I cannot doubt that he was there because I was there, Herbert. I asked him how he was dressed, prosperously in black. Was his face at all disfigured? He believed not. He could recall no more, so I treated him to a meal and we parted. No one was near me when I arrived here, I swear. Herbert? We must communicate this to Wemmick. Yes. But might I not compromise him by going too often to the castle? Then by letter. You write it, I'll go out and post it. Handle, we must be very cautious. And we were more cautious than before, if that were possible. And I, for my part, never went near Chink's Basin, except when I rode by. And then I only looked at Mill Pond Bank as I looked at anything else. The second meeting occurred about a week later. I had once more left my boat at the wharf below the bridge, and, undecided where to dine, I strolled up Cheapside. Mr Pip! Ah. As we're going in the same direction, we may walk together. Where are you bound for? The temple, I think. Well, don't you know? I don't know, for I've not made up my mind. You're going to dine. You don't mind admitting that, I suppose. No, I don't. And you are not engaged? I don't mind admitting also that I am not engaged. Then come and dine with me. Uh, I... Wemmick is coming. We went to Gerard Street, and as soon as we got there, dinner was served. Give Mr. Pip Miss Havisham's note, Wemmick. Now, you'll note it's a note of two lines, Pip, sent up to me on account of her not being sure of your address. She tells me that she wants to see you on a little matter of business you mentioned to her. You'll go down? I have an impending engagement that renders me rather uncertain of my time. At once, I think. So, Pip, our friend the Spider has played his cards. He's won the pool. Yes. As I said, he is a promising fella in his way, but he may not have it all his way. The stronger will win in the end, but the stronger has to be found out first. If he should turn to and beat her... Surely you do not seriously think that he is scoundrel enough for that. I didn't say so, Pip. I'm putting a case. <sighs> and I like our friend the spider either beats... Or cringes, ask Wemmick. Either beats or cringes. So, here's to Mrs. Bentley Drummle. And may the question of supremacy be settled to the lady's satisfaction. To the satisfaction of the lady and the gentleman, it will never be. Molly, how slow you are today. She was at his elbow when he addressed her, and a certain action of her fingers as he spoke arrested my attention. What's the matter? Nothing. Only the subject we were speaking of was rather painful to me. The action of her fingers was like that of knitting. I looked at those hands, those eyes, that flowing hair, and I compared them with other hands eyes, other hair I knew of, and what they would be like after twenty years of a brutal husband and a stormy life. And I felt absolutely certain that this woman was Estella's mother. Oh, more wine, anybody? Molly, be sharp. Wemmick. Do you remember telling me, before I first went to Mr Jagger's private house, to notice the housekeeper? A wild beast tamed, you called her. And what do you? The same. How did Mr Jagger's tame her? I wish you'd tell me her story. You know what is said between you and me goes no further. I have good reason to ask. A score or so years ago, that woman was tried at the Old Bailey for murder and was acquitted. Mr Jaggers was for her and worked the case in a way quite astonishing. In fact, it may almost be said to have made him. The murdered person was a woman ten years older, very much larger, 
and very much stronger. It was a case of jealousy. They both led tramping lives, and Molly had been married very young over a broomstick to a tramping man and was a perfect fury in point of jealousy. The murdered woman was found dead in a barn near Hounslow Heath. There'd been a violent fight, and she'd been held at the throat at last and choked. There was no reasonable evidence to implicate anybody but Molly. But it was on the improbabilities of her having been able to do it that Mr Jaggers principally rested his case. <laughs> he never dwelt upon the strength of her hands then, though he sometimes does now. He dressed Molly in long, fragile sleeves. Bruises? <laughs> Nothing for a tramp. But the lacerations on the back of her hands. She had struggled through a great lot of brambles, which didn't reach her face, and jaggers provided the broken brambles. It was attempted to be set up in proof of her jealousy, that she was under strong suspicion of having, at about the time of the murder, frantically destroyed her child by this man, some three years old, to revenge herself upon him. Mr Jaggers worked that beautifully. We say these are not marks of fingernails, but marks of brambles. And we show you the brambles. You say they are marks of fingernails, and you set up the hypothesis that she destroyed her child. For anything we know, she may have destroyed her child, and the child in clinging to her may have scratched her hands. What then? You are not trying her for the murder of her child. Why don't you? As to this case, if you will have scratches, we say that for anything we know, we have accounted for them. But to sum up, Mr Jaggers was altogether too many for the jury, and they gave in. She went into his service immediately, but she was tamed from the beginning. Do you remember the sex of the child? Said to have been a girl. Come in. There was an air of utter loneliness upon Miss Havisham as she sat near the hearth in a ragged chair, lost in contemplation of an ashy fire. It is I, Pip. Mr Jaggers gave me your note yesterday. I want to pursue that subject you mentioned to me when you were last here, and to show you that I am not all the stone. How much money do you need for your friend? Nine hundred pounds. If I give you it, will you keep my secret as you have your own? Quite faithfully. Can I only serve you, Pip, by serving your friend? Regarding that as done, is there nothing I can do for yourself? Uh, nothing. I thank you for the question and for its tone. But there is nothing. This is an authority to Jaggers to pay you the money to lay out at your irresponsible discretion for your friend. My name is on the first leaf. If you can ever write under my name, I forgive her, though ever so long after my broken heart is dust, pray do it. There. Oh, Miss Havisham. I can do it now. There have been sore mistakes, and my life has been a blind and thankless one. And I want forgiveness and direction far too much to be bitter with you. <laughs> to my amazement and terror, she dropped to her knees at my feet. 
I tried to raise her, but she hung her head over my hands and wept. I had never seen her shed a single tear before. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? If you mean Miss Havisham, what have you done to injure me? Let me answer very little. I should have loved her under any circumstances. What have I done? Is... Is she married? Yes. What have I done? I knew not how to answer or how to comfort her. And I couldn't look down upon her without compassion, seeing her punishment in the ruin she was. Until you spoke to her the other day, and until I saw in you a looking glass that showed me what I once felt myself, I did not know what I had done. What have I done? Miss, Miss Havisham, Miss Havisham, <laughs> you may dismiss me from your mind and conscience, but Estella is a different case. And if you can ever undo any scrap of what you've done amiss in keeping a part of her right nature away from her, it will be better to do that than to bemoan the past through a hundred years. But Pip, my dear, my dear, believe this. When she first came to me, I meant to save her from misery like my own. At first I meant no more. But then as she grew and promised to be very beautiful, I gradually did worse. And with my praises and with my jewels and with my teachings and with this figure of myself always before her, a warning to back and point my lesson, I stole her heart away and put ice in its place. If you knew all my story, you, you would have some compassion. And a better understanding of me. Miss Havisham, I do know your story. Does what has passed between us give me the right to ask you a question? About Estella? Yes. Not as she is, but as she was when she first came here. Go on. Whose child was Estella? You don't know? No. Mr. Jaggers brought her here or sent her here? Brought her. Why? I'd been shut up in these rooms a long time. I don't know how long. You know what time the clock keeps here. When I told Jaggers I wanted a little girl to rear and love and save from my fate. I'd first seen him when I sent for him to lay this place waste for me. I'd read of him in the newspapers before I and the world parted. He said he would look about him for such an orphan child. One night, he brought her here asleep, and I called her Estella. Might I ask her age, then? Two or three. She herself knows nothing but that she was left an orphan, and I adopted her. What more could I hope to do by prolonging the interview? She had told me all she knew of Estella. I had said and done what I could to ease her mind. No matter with what other words we parted, we parted. Twilight was closing in when I went downstairs into the natural air. I wanted to walk around the place before leaving, for I had a feeling that I should never be there again and I felt that dying light was suited to my last view of it. I made my way to the ruined garden. I went all round it, round by the corner where Herbert and I had fought our battle, round by the paths where Estella and I had walked. So cold, so lonely, so dreary all. Passing on into the front courtyard, I hesitated whether to leave or first to go upstairs and assure myself that Miss Havisham was as safe and well as I had left her. I took the latter course and went up. 
She was as I had left her, seated in the ragged chair upon the hearth close to the fire with her back to me. In the moment, when I was withdrawing my head to go quietly away, I saw a great flaming light spring up, and in the same moment she was running at me, shrieking, with a whirl of fire blazing all about her and soaring at least as many feet above her head as she was high. I had a double-caped greatcoat on, and over my arm another thick coat. I got them off, closed with her, threw her down and got them over her. I dragged the great cloth from the table for the same purpose, and with it down cascaded the heap of rottenness in the midst, and all the ugly things that sheltered there. We were on the ground, struggling like desperate enemies, and the closer I covered her, the more wildly she shrieked and tried to free herself. Servants came in, but I still held her forcibly down, and I doubt if I even knew who she was, or why we had struggled, or that she had been in flames. Or that the flames were out, until I saw the patches of tinder that had been her bridal dress, no longer alight, but falling in a black shower around us. By the surgeon's directions, her bed was carried into the room and laid upon the great table, which happened to be well suited to the dressing of her injuries. When I saw her again, she lay indeed. Where I had seen her strike a stick and had heard her say that she would lie one day. As I could do no further useful service, and as I had nearer home, even more pressing reason for anxiety and fear, I decided in the course of the night that I would return to Garden Court by the early morning coach. At about six o'clock of the morning, therefore, I leaned over her. And touched her lips with mine, just as they said, not stopping for being touched. Take the pencil and write under my name. I forgive her. In episode five of Great Expectations, Pip was played by Douglas Hodge, and Miss Havisham by Geraldine McEwen. Timothy Bateson was Wemmick, John Shrapnel Jaggers, and Robert Lang Magwitch. James Simmons played Herbert, and Timothy Carlton Wopsle. The music was composed by Malcolm Clark. Great Expectations was dramatized by Ray Jenkins, and directed by Sally Avans.